You're watching Comcast Cable Channel 27, 100 and Central Television. Your school, your station. Well, thank you so much, uh, Leslie and Prosecutor. Thank you for your leadership, Karen, Jerry, everybody uh, from Prevention Resources. It's true, uh, Leslie, especially Leslie and Jerry, especially corner me. I can't, get, I can't, nothing I can do to get away from them. I think you all probably feel that same way. I was, we were once at a conference. I was on purpose staying five hotels down, you know, not to just, you know, to get some privacy once in a while. It was a nice day. It was in Orange County. I thought, well, you know, I'll go for a little dip. I don't need to go to every single workshop. You know, we, I'll go for a little dip at like 2.30 in the afternoon. No one's going to be here. And I'm, I'm there and I'm, you know, swimming away. I'm, this is great. And then I sort of come up from the water and there's Leslie and Jerry standing and looking at me down. Um, can you come to our conference that's coming in two months? No, but, that, but it's great. It was great to run into you there. Now, I really uh, appreciate what everybody is doing. You guys have done a phenomenal job with prevention resources. I actually am a kid of a drug-free coalition. I mean, the reason I'm standing here today is because when I was 13 years old, because of friends that were getting into trouble in a community not so different from this, although on the other side of the country, uh, you know, th this was not an issue, addiction, that anybody wanted to talk about. You know, the, the hallmark of addiction is denial, as we all know. Denial from society, denial from whether it's insurance companies, elected officials, parents, schools, it's denial. And that's why having everybody here acknowledging the issues is so important. But I got involved first as part of an anti-drug coalition that uh, was started in the mid-90s uh, before there were, you know, a lot, so many that there are now. And that really got my sort of gave me the bug of, of wanting to stay in this field and I didn't think I'd be here 25 years later uh, to still talking about this stuff but um, I think it's more important than ever because I feel like sometimes I wake up and it's, uh, it's like we're a hundred years ago dealing with tobacco with this issue with marijuana I don't know if I'm the only one that thinks that but we are essentially living in 1918 tobacco right now what was going on in 1918 well in 1918, we had early research showing the link between tobacco and cancer, tobacco and uh, uh, addiction, even though the government didn't acknowledge it for 50 years and the industry didn't pay for it for 75 years. Um, w science was beginning to emerge. We also had an industry that was just starting and really starting to fund their own science, starting to fund elected officials, starting to advertise and claim that their product was medical. We had in the late 1800s asthma cigarettes, if you can believe it. And, uh, but they were, very they were very responsible because the industry, at least they said, not recommended for children under six. <laughs> and you can Google it, it's real. Uh, and, uh, you know, but this was what we did. And no one would have thought 100 years later that we'd be living in a society where I mean, I don't even know where you can smoke. I don't even know where you can smoke anymore, let alone smoke in restaurants, airplanes, uh, the places we used to always smoke. Uh, we've made tremendous progress, but it's come at a massive price. In fact, there are more people dying of lung cancer related to tobacco, because that's not overnight, today than there were 50 years ago. Because it takes time, and we're still paying the price. So whenever anyone says, well, shouldn't we try legalization, regulation, uh, we've tried it. And we have our two legal drugs, which are eight times as deadly as the worst year of the opiate epidemic. They're killing more people the, every year, the equivalent of eight Vietnam Wars a year for the last 70 years. I can't tell you how many 9-11s that would be. You can do the math. But we have 550,000 people a year dead because of the two drugs that are quote unquote regulated and that re in reality aren't regulated very well are very normalized, commercialized, promoted, advertised. They don't keep kids away who are under 21. Uh, and it's a, huge pro it's a huge challenge. Now we, we live with that challenge for a lot of reasons that alcohol has been in our culture for you know, thousands of years. That's not going away. Prohibition did not last. Uh, not because it failed by some metric. Prohibition didn't last because it's hard to prohibit something 70% of people are doing regularly. It, we made that deal and we're dealing with it every day. We arrest more people for alcohol than all drugs combined by a factor of two. Um, uh, 
I don't think most Americans realize that. And it's a deal that we've made, and that's fine. We're trying to do our best. Why in the world we'd want to do that again when we could actually control it right now and, and stop that from happening is really beyond me. So it's important to get into this discussion because um, I actually don't think the train has completely left the station. I know it might be unpopular, or maybe I'm you know tilting at windmills here, uh, but. There are a lot of, first of all, we know, I was last here in June of 2015. Did anybody predict who was going to be president of the United States in June of 2015? Maybe some people did, but let's be, let's be real. Politics changes quickly. Attitudes change quickly. Um, there are a lot of things that can still be done, if anything, at the local level, which is what we're seeing around the state with banning pot shops. Did you know that most localities in California and Colorado have banned the sales of marijuana. They banned it. They don't want any of it. Most localities in those states. So there's a lot that we can do, and I think sometimes we feel like sort of it, sort of this inevitability. There's helpless. There's really you know, it's coming. We have you know, it's what what can we do about it? I don't think so. I think there's a lot we can do in terms of education, local control. Um, frankly, a lot of things to at the very least stall. Uh, you know, the, the number one pot-loving state in this country after Colorado is actually a state called Vermont, where the senior senator is, in, is, is legalizing, wanting to legalize where, you know, uh, Ben and Jerry are funding some of that. I hate to say it because I like their ice cream too, but, uh, you know, they're kind of laid back about it and there are more people smoking marijuana in Vermont than any state except, well, lo and behold, Colorado. Uh, but they have not legalized the sales of marijuana. And they thought they were going to do so six years ago. They actually had the first governor. It's not yours. You can so uh, I don't have to disappoint you. They had the first governor, sitting governor, who wanted to do this was uh, Pete Shumlin, and and they weren't able to do it. And the reason they weren't able to do it is because when people realized it meant selling THC candy, cookies, ice cream, and sodas on Main Street, they didn't want it. When people realized it meant secondhand smoke and it meant coming through the vents in the, you know, uh, multifamily dwellings, and it meant driving impaired, they weren't, uh, they weren't excited about it. And uh, it really was a matter of activating. That's why it's so great that we had the uh, uh, clergy here and the religious community, because as leaders in the community, it's very, very important that we really tell community members what this is really about, and then they can decide for themselves. So, I, you know, Vermont hasn't done it yet. I'm not sure um, that necessarily this is coming tomorrow in New Jersey. I'm also a realist. I realize there are a lot of pressures. And there's a lot of pressures because of one thing and one thing only. And that's what this whole movement is about. And I think you all know what that is, money. This is about a small number of people who want to get very rich. And these are about guys that look a lot more like me than they do Grateful Dead heads or anything you know they did I went to Berkeley in California undergrad they didn't Leslie didn't mention that um, and I had a group called you've heard this a lot but it's I had a group called citizens for a drug-free Berkeley and I thought we all needed a laugh today that's why I brought it up because it was about as popular as the coalition for a wine-free France uh, just in terms of who wanted to join uh, but the issue was you know, God love the, those, those hippies at Berkeley, and they're still, I don't know what they're protesting today, and they're playing their drums, and it's wonderful, but let me tell you something, they're not the ones making money and pushing this movement. The guys that are making money are actually the ones that graduated from the Haas School of Business that got an MBA, who I went to school with, uh, who are doing this to get rich, which is what you do when you go into an industry. That's, of course, what you do. And my worry is that when you unleash the sort of commercialization, the advertising, the promotion. This isn't about, I have a lot of libertarian friends, they want to do what you want to do. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm not talking about what you're doing. But the issue is, it's not about your behavior on a micro level. It's about an industry that is going to be promoting heavy use, promoting regular use. What industry says, I don't want people to use my product that much? You know, when I see enjoy responsibly on the bottom of, a, of an alcohol ad, it's really funny, because if everyone enjoyed responsibly, we'd, we'd, our alcohol problems would be cut by 80%. It's not about enjoy responsibly. It's about enjoy really irresponsibly, because that's how we make money. And we don't need all of you to enjoy irresponsibly, but a good chunk of you would be great. That's essentially what it is. And so if it's about an individual wanting to do something you know, after work, that's not what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm talking about the fact that this would unleash an industry which then the government is supporting, which is then funding our elected officials, which is then having special interests over 
public health. And I have yet to see where public health is put over private profit. I'm still waiting for something to be regulated. I'm still waiting for all that tax revenue that should be saving the state already from gambling, alcohol, and tobacco. Uh, I'm still waiting for us to have alcohol treatment on demand at the very least for the percentage of alcoholics that need it based on our alcohol taxes. We have record cigarette taxes. I'm still waiting for anywhere in the country to have on-demand, evidence-based tobacco cessation and tobacco treatment. Not a, not a phone line, not a, you know, I'm, I'm talking about comprehensive treatment with all this quote-unquote money we're all making. It's a false promise. It's a false promise of money. We've heard it before and we're hearing it again because the issue is most people are not going to smoke marijuana or use marijuana if it's legal. You're not going to use other drugs if they become legal either. They don't need to convince you that it's great for you to use it. They need to convince you that it's good for society, right? That will we'll fund your schools. That will get rid of, you know, social justice will be achieved. I don't think liquor, having eight times as many liquor stores in poor communities of color in this country that we have is social justice. I, I don't think it's social justice when actually I can count with one finger the number of marijuana businesses that are any, by any metric successful in a legal state owned by anybody that doesn't have my skin color. I can count one. So if, if people want to talk about social justice, that's fine. But I don't see how enabling intoxication is social justice. And actually, on the contrary, it's the people who can't afford getting out of that who are hurt the most, right? I mean, we fall in life many times. If you have the resources to have a lot of people catch you before your head hits the ground, that's great. You're able to go to the treatment that costs 100000 a year. You're able to drug test positive at work because your uncle can get you a job somewhere else where you won't need to be drug tested. You're able to have a third and fourth chance because you have a great lawyer that you can work with. But for a lot of those folks, especially you know, as part of our NJ Ramp campaign, we had Bishop Jethro James from Newark. What he tells me is that they're not going to be able to afford that. They're not going to have that second chance. And all they're going to have is a concentration of stores selling an intoxicated substance. And it's not the substance that you're thinking about because it's not the old joint. It's something a lot more powerful than we've, than we've seen, really we've ever seen in the history of the world. We've never had THC over 30 percent other than in the last 15 years. So we're doing something that we don't even understand what the long-term consequences are. Um, so we started SAM. I, I, I left the, uh, the White House in 2011. We started SAM and SAM Action as with actually a, another a New Jersey boy, Patrick Kennedy, well, new, newly New Jersey boy, I guess, since he married a Jersey girl, um, who's expecting his fifth child, I think, in about a week, which is great, uh, and down, down south in South Jersey, who, you know, we started this as a way to enhance the education of people because we saw that when you polled Americans about marijuana, most of them thought it wasn't addictive, safer than alcohol, it doesn't impair driving, and it, you know, maybe we can get some tax revenue. And there's so much misinformation out there, and people are not necessarily, I, I've said this many times, reading the journal of the American Medical Association, you know, before they go to bed, or not everybody's up on the latest research from, you know, coming out of the UK that's looked at, looking at 25% THC marijuana and what that does to you for psychosis and how it actually triples your risk for schizophrenia-like psychosis. Most people don't realize that, and so we need to get science and the language that people can understand, work with communities and really educate and increase awareness. And in New Jersey, we started something called New Jersey Ramp, Responsible Approaches to Marijuana Policy. That's really been trying to educate uh, in this whole conversation about marijuana. Um, and of course, you know, the, the papers of course love it because in the short term, a lot of the papers will make money from the ad revenue. Uh, but talk to the Denver Post and ask them how that story ends. Uh, and any of you can Google, which is sad how that story, we don't want anybody in the media laid off. You should see how successful the Denver Post has been in the long term since marijuana. They've just closed uh, uh, their marijuana, uh, their whole marijuana shop. They had a massive thing called the Cannabis, which had marijuana coverage. They were so excited they were going to get the pot industry to fund all of the awesome media things. And we were like, boy, I wonder what's going to happen. What happened was that wasn't sustainable and they're now out of business. So even for the newspapers, this is not something that is long-term beneficial. But we wanted to really enter this. Grace Hanlon, who's the former tourism commissioner of the state, um, is our current coordinator. And we've you know, done multiple hearings, creating a big coalition, working with many people in this room. You know, when a lot of people talk about marijuana, they ask about the polls. And they say, look, the polls say everybody wants it, more than 60%. If you ask, do you, agree, do you think the use of marijuana should be made legal? 
the issue, I saw that poll, and what I said was, you know what, we need to um, ask a follow-up question. If we gave people another option, which is basically removing criminal penalties, how far does that support, how much does that support uh, remain? And the reality was 60% of people were in favor of legalization, and then the very next question, that fell to below 40%. When you gave someone an option of essentially removing criminal penalties for possession. See, a lot of people have this myth that our prisons are full of people whose only crime is smoking a joint or two. And uh, you know, I'm sorry, prosecutor, I know you spent all day on those cases, and that's really what you're focused on. Um, <laughs> the reality is it's a tiny percentage of what's happening local, state, and national. It's a, it's a huge myth, uh, along with the marijuana is not addictive. I would say the two big myths, the biggest ones uh, on this issue. And, but that's a perception that's very hard to shake. So when you take that out, though, that's a lot of the reason why people support legalization in the first place. They think it's about ending the quote unquote war on drugs or getting people not to be arrested. Uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey liked that methodology that we introduced so much. They funded their own independent poll and were surprised themselves when they found that they had less than 40% wanted legalization when they were given a choice. See, we're often given just a binary choice. Do you want to legalize or this <coughs> status quo, which people think is incarcerate? So that's the false choice. And when you're giving, uh, giving people other options, like, you know, how about treatment instead? How about an assessment, early intervention? Um, essentially, a speeding ticket, but if you do it three times in a month, we're going to see if you have a problem and get you help. A lot of spectrum of options that we could offer. And Senator Ron Rice actually has a bill. Um, offering some of those options that we support. Uh, and the reality is, when you give people those options, they do not support the legalization of marijuana because, again, people aren't doing this because they think you know, they want to go get high, everybody wants to. It's not about everybody wanting to get high. It's about some of the misperceptions they have. Uh, and so, you know, there's been a lot of, I would say, actually, good, some good coverage talking about um, the opposition on this talking about how this is not a done deal. And I just think it's important to remember that this is not a done deal because we can feel very helpless with just all, all of these issues. We're very happy, this is only two, the, the, this is, these are old, but there have been multiple places around the state, many more than just these two, that have passed ordinances banning pot shops. Because again, people might say, well, you can do what you want in your own house, I guess, I don't care well, if you want whiskey or a, a joint, whatever. But when it comes to actually a pot shop on Main Street, they're not happy about it, and it backfires. And actually, we've been warning politicians, if you're a local politician, this will backfire on you. And unless you're part of a very fringe part of your state that loves it and wants it everywhere, which there may be, but most places, most people don't want to be around it all the time and see it in their face. Because this is an activity that less than 10% of people are doing on a regular basis. This isn't something that everybody feels so strongly about and they don't want to be criminalized, so they want to see it everywhere. It's very, very different than alcohol. Um, but I wanted to, you know, Leslie and Jerry, they asked me to talk about some of the different impacts that are going on, um, and I, I, we highlighted a, a few of them. First is the business impact. Uh, surprise, surprise, more stoned employees are not good for business. <laughs> I know, it's like rockets, so how long is it going to tell me, you know, to take me to tell you that? So you can go get dessert if you want, if you don't want to hear the details. Um, but the reality is there's kind of four main points. First, there's unique dangers to the workplace in terms of workplace accidents, in ter much more so than alcohol, given that marijuana stays in your system a lot longer. Remember, alcohol is a f uh, marijuana is a far more complex chemical structure than alcohol ethanol alcohol. What happens is marijuana, a complex plant, hundreds of ingredients in it, THC absorbs in the fat. It stays in your system for a long time and reaches your brain. Very, very different than alcohol in and out of your system in 24 hours. In fact, after you don't feel high anymore on marijuana, you are usually still impaired in ways that you may not even be able to detect. And how do we know that? We've tested pilots, we've tested drivers, we've tested people taking <laughs> cognitive tests. You give them THC, they do terribly the first time around, but it's expected, right, because they're high. They come back the next day, they think they're great now, they've had a nice shower, they've eaten, they feel totally normal to the, if you ask them. And they're still failing a lot of those tests, which is very interesting. And, and we don't really know how it, we're still learning about it, we don't exactly know how it affects everybody. We will not have a .08 level of impairment for marijuana. It cannot exist. Now, a legislature could make one up, that's fine. You can make up on any number and say that's impairment. From a legal point of view, you, sh you could do whatever you want.
But from a scientific point of view, there is no standard level of impairment. This makes the driving issue a huge problem. In fact, um, you know, I love that law enforcement is uniformly against legalization. They know they're for public safety, but if they were very selfish people, they'd be for it. Because we're gonna need many, many more law enforcement. I mean, we just will. I'll tell you why. Driving, we're gonna have to train all of them and get many more of these DREs, which are the drug recognition experts. What are they? They're people that they do behavioral tests to figure out if you're high. You know, the eyes and the walking, the check, they, but they're specially trained. Uh, although in New Jersey, I know there's an issue with a search warrant and you'd have to change the law there. It does not make it easy to go after impaired driving. In fact, I've talked to a lot of prosecutors and others on this issue and they say, well, you know, Kevin, contrary to popular belief, most people who are high while they are driving are also drunk. And we usually get them on the drunk driving charge because that's easy to convict on a .08 with a jury. Uh, with marijuana, they could have a huge amount in their system, but there, since there is no legal standard, since it's a subjective behavioral test, uh, it's very hard for a jury who just really wants a black and white thing, are they impaired or are they not, based on the law. And you know, already it's very difficult to deal with this issue. You can imagine when there's so many more drivers on the road. And in Washington State, AAA tells us they have doubled the number of fatal car crashes related to marijuana. And there was some pushback in the Star-Ledger that was totally erroneous by people I don't think who study science who are saying, well, that study, they weren't looking at the right thing. I, you talk to AAA Traffic Safety uh, Board, and I, I think I would trust them over you know, a columnist who writes about all kinds of things, which is great, but they're not scientists studying this issue. Um, the second thing is, well, we've seen workplace marijuana use particularly high in our legal states like Colorado and Washington. Uh, we just got some new data on that. The marijuana lobby has promised to make workers' rights to use marijuana a priority, and they have to do that because marijuana stays in your system for a while. They realize an Achilles heel for them is that if the workforce said, society, you can do governor, legislature, you can do whatever you want, you can leak a lot, but we're going to be testing people a lot more, and we can't afford forklift operators, factory worker, workers, nuclear workers, doctors, pilots. We can't afford them to be high, so we'll be testing more and you can legalize or whatnot. Well, if you test the workplace, that's gonna, in a sense, nullify anyone who's in the workforce uh, from being able to use marijuana because it does stay in your system for a long time. So they realize, look, we gotta make it so that it's not just if you test positive without anything else that you know, you're out. We gotta change that. So they are very worried about the impact on the workplace. Uh, and there's a huge impact on labor pool. You know, in our country right now, it's a great thing in terms of unemployment. Um, the, but the pool of reliable, unskilled labor is very small, very, very small. It's a huge issue if you are working in these areas and if you're a business owner. Uh, and on top of it, in legal states, it's becoming very hard to find someone who can pass a drug test, especially in these jobs where you really want somebody working, for example, in construction to pass a drug test. In Colorado, they can't hire anybody in their state anymore who can pass a drug test if they're in the construction business. The largest construction employer goes um, to the surrounding states, Utah, Idaho, fewer marijuana users over there than Colorado. Uh, that's a huge issue and it's become, a, it's become a big thing in terms of testing. The New York Times covered it, uh, as did CNN, talking about refugees, many, many more refugees uh, and immigrants because they are much less likely to test positive for marijuana and other drugs are being hired uh, over American workers because of the testing rate. Um, we've noticed, and this got cut off, that so as I was saying, positive uh, workplace marijuana rates have tripled since the year Colorado legalized recreational marijuana. It's not going up in the United States at that rate. It's going up, but in a much, uh, much less rate than that. Um, they're rising, I said, especially in Washington and Colorado. Uh, even when controlling for alcohol use, marijuana users are 40% more likely to have missed at least a day of work in the last month due to illness and injury, and 106% more likely to have missed at least one day. This is my favorite, because they just didn't want to be there. <laughs> it sounds about, it sounds like late night comedy or something. That was the, you know, there were, you know, sickness and this and that and parental issues, and also just, the stoners just didn't want to be there. That was the kind of what it was. Um, I gotta tell you, when I go abroad and talk about this issue, the when, especially when I go to Asia, the jaws on the floor uh, from people 
government, education, they're like, wait a minute, you guys in the United States, you like think this is good for your country? Like you think that the 21st century global economy, this is gonna be good for jobs? It's pretty incredible when you, when you talk to um, advanced nations around the world about this. And when we've done studies on accidents, discipline, et cetera, these things are much more likely among people who smoke marijuana, or use marijuana, it's not just smoke, obviously. Um, and that's, that goes without saying. Um, there have been studies about, you know, we hear that isn't pot safer than alcohol in every single way. Actually, when it comes to a lot of the studies, it's not. Uh, I'm not defending alcohol. Alcohol kills 100,000 people a year. You've heard my rant on that. But uh, at the end of the day, it's a very, very different substance in terms of impairment um, than, than marijuana. Um, workers' comp rates, and I'm not going to dwell on all this. I do want to have time to have questions, but workers' comp rates, insurance, these are all issues that aren't really usually talked about in this discussion of marijuana. What does this mean for insurance, liability? What does this, I mean, I think trial lawyers will love this. Um, many, many more lawsuits about to happen if this becomes legal. Uh, you know, hey, I, I slipped on the floor and, and broke my you know, leg because my boss left the, uh, left the uh, floor slippery, not because I was you know, stoned out of my mind, and you can't prove that me being stoned would even do that, and yet you can prove that a slippery floor would do that. I mean, the number of things that are happening in legal states with lawyers on this is pretty incredible. Um, this was the recent study that just came out in the newly legal states, the increase in marijuana positivity, not only among 4%, which is okay when you average it, but 8% in the safety sensitive workforce. You know, because of that is, those are like nuclear handlers, pilots, truck drivers who are driving in this state, that's for sure. Uh, and these extremely safety sensitive positions. And you know, I, I sometimes I feel like we have to burn our hand on the stove to like realize it's hot. Um, I really hope we don't have to in this case with marijuana, because it will. I mean, and this shows how I think flimsy everything is. One tragedy, God forbid, this whole thing's over. Well, this whole talk about there's no way that any politician would put their name to it. I don't want us to have to get there, at all. But I think we really need to think about the implications for this. Um, and you know, the one thing I, I hear a lot of people say, well, Kevin, it's sort of, you got to get with the time. It's like a modern thing. You know, it's like just kind of where the country's going, you know, like the gender neutral bathroom, same sex marriage, legal pot. And I'm like, wait a minute. I, I, legal pot is not in that category. Now, I don't care if you love gender neutral bathrooms, hate them. If you love same sex marriage, think it's morally wrong. Regardless of where you stand on it, if my kid is in a bus with a driver who's in a same-sex marriage, that is fundamentally different than if he's in a bus with a driver who's waking and baking every day and stoned out of their mind. That's a fundamental difference. One is a public health issue. One is a, another issue, whether it's, you can say it's a moral issue. You can say all kinds of issues, but the impact is different. The practical impact is different. And I think a lot of times, the reason a lot of millennials and others are sort of on this bandwagon um, is because it just seems like it's like kind of like the modern, it's like the right thing to do. It's like where we're going. It's, you can't, I mean, unless you're a backward thinking Neanderthal, who wouldn't want to legalize pot? Like that seems like the sensible, right thing to do. Uh, and you really, really have to push back on that, especially when you count the social costs. And people talk about the revenue all the time, but it's like having a business and saying I sold a hundred grand in ice cream last year. It was a great year. It was awesome. Oh, well, how much did it cost you to sell that? Well, 300 grand. <laughs> okay, well, it wasn't a great business. You should get out of business. And that's the issue with social cost. You have to have both sides of the ledger. If I have to hear one more person in this state talk about the potential revenue, but not in the same breath mention uh, the potential costs, I don't want to hear it. Because it's, you, you, ha you have to look at both sides. We looked at both sides in the state of Connecticut and some other states where we said, well, can we calculate? And with, with, with economists and experts, basically we found that, surprise, surprise, in a very conservative estimate, it was about two or three to one in terms of a ratio of tax revenue to cost because of drug driving, workplace issues work. Workplace issues and driving were the two big ones. Administrative costs, um, you want to start a whole bureaucracy to test, sell, grow, regulate, label, manage, uh, tax revenue, I mean, on marijuana, that costs money. And then I have to, this costs money for law enforcement. Uh, on and on and on and on in terms of the potential costs that we often don't think about. But again, when you're sometimes a local elected official, 
I don't care about costs in 10 years. I don't even care about five years. Show me what's gonna happen this year. And if I can show you that I'm getting tax revenue done, and that's really the short-sightedness of our politics, I think. I mean, this doesn't even include, how do you quantify you know, a kid who's gonna, in eighth grade today, but by 11th grade is dropping out of high school? That's a cost to society. But you're not gonna know that for a while. And I think it's reckless that we wanna take that risk. We've done a new report, and it's for free on our website. Our website is learnaboutsam, learnaboutsam.org. And there's a Colorado and other state report where we have infographics like this. You'll see things like the hospitalization rates related to marijuana go up. You'll see things like the poison center calls. Remember, when you have an edible of marijuana, like a non-smoked, uh, it takes about 20 or 30 minutes for it to actually process through your system to feel that high. So a lot of people, what we're seeing is, first of all, a lot of baby boomers who haven't used marijuana in 30 years who say like, Oh yeah, I remember what it was like in the 60s. My buddy used to make like some brownies. What's the difference? And they're grabbing a muffin and like, oh, this isn't so bad. I don't, I don't really feel anything. And then three muffins later and 20 minutes later, they're in, on a stretcher having had a psychotic episode spending three nights in the hospital. Um, it sounds like crazy to say that if you just kind of think about like passing a joint around a room and what's gonna happen. But this kind of stuff really is happening because we're not talking about the old joints anymore. Uh, I, I always like to say uh, what happened once when I was at a school and somebody talked about a roach clip. That was in 2018. Someone said the, word, the term roach clip. Um, they thought they were talking about, in, the kids thought they were, they were talking about insect extermination. <laughs> they were like, what does this have to do? And I, even with the age, and, you know, half the room is looking at me like, what are you talking about? Ask your parents. Um, <laughs> It's like, but it's a totally different scene. It's not about smoking, and smoking is a very uh, efficient way to get any drug, but again, when you eat something and it takes time to absorb. Uh, smoking is also much more passe, thanks to anti-tobacco efforts, so now we're seeing the vaping and the e-cigarettes, which is really a worse nightmare scenario for schools, because you can't smell it, you can barely see it, you have no idea what's in it, is it tobacco, is it THC, is it, you have no clue. Um, it looks like a highlighter, it looks like a flash drive, those are, and it's being sold as a safe alternative, it's safe, right? Vaporizing is safe, this is generally what it's sold as. Along with marijuana, because marijuana is just a plant, right? It's just a plant from uh, someone, and I, you know, I'm gonna say this in front of religious people, someone said, you know, Kevin, it's a plant from God, and you, you know, are you anti-God? Because it's from plant, and it was in the Bible. And I said, oh, yeah, I, poison ivy is also from God, and I don't think you should smoke it. <laughs> I mean, so sharks are from God. I want nothing to do with them. I mean, it's just the, these arguments that we get, the natural. Um, by the way, there's nothing natural about today's marijuana, nothing. I mean, unless you're gonna go back in time in, with the Egyptians and the cannabis plant and how it was grown then, what is being genetically modified and engineered today to increase the THC has zero to do with any way nature intended the cannabis plant, if you even wanna say that. Even if you're gonna say that it's, you know, it's not like poison ivy or whatever. Um, so it's, being, it's totally being changed, and this is causing many, many more health problems um, because people are ingesting THC and they're not used to it. In schools, marijuana is the number one now issue in Colorado in terms of uh, offenses in public schools. And guess how many more stu student counselors they have or school safety officers? Can you guess what that number is? It's a very big number. That would be zero. Um, so it's not like that money is going to them. They don't have smaller class sizes. Well, what, what's going on with the money? Well, you know, ask your legislator. What goes on with any, any of the tax revenue? You can find out. But the idea that you're getting it back and we're reinvesting in communities is a huge myth. Um, I just, I think there's, it's important. There's also quality of life issues. This is a tweet from like the most famous sort of local celebrity in Denver uh, broadcaster, which I thought was really telling. Leaving the Colorado Symphony at the Fillmore, I'm accosted on the sidewalk by a remarkably high woman. Lady nearby turns and says, and that's the most Colorado thing you've seen today. Um, I mean, you have to think about what you want your communities to be known for, what, how you want your communities to look in terms of the behaviors that are going on and what's happening. Uh, I don't know if you've been in downtown Denver lately or if you want to stay at the 16th Street Mall, but it is totally a different place than it was five or six years ago. It's just amazing what that change has, has been. The homelessness issue is a huge issue now um, because mainly of young runaways and people thinking, erroneously, I'll put it, but it doesn't matter, thinking, oh, free pot, you can do it anywhere, and it doesn't matter, I mean, even though it is illegal to smoke in public. It, I mean, they put, you know, people will say, well, we're not gonna be like Colorado. I'll, I hear this a lot. 
east of the Mississippi. We're not going to be like those wild west out there. We're going to do things properly and get it right. And we always, it's our state. We do everything the best. And by the way, every, every state just thinks they do it the best. Just FYI. Um, which is impossible. It can only be one best. <laughs> it's, I have to tell parents often because every parent thinks their kid is above average. And then I have to explain to them what that really means in my definition. They, they're not happy. Um, but you can't all be above average. That's impossible. mathematically impossible. Um, but the issue is the le legal marijuana drawing people to Colorado, young runaways, homeless, unfortunately increasing the homeless population. We have a whole section in our report on the impact of homelessness. The Visit Denver website, which is a state-run website, and trust me, the state of Colorado wants to look at the, is looking at this through rose-colored glasses, Pollyanna. Things are great. Literally, the sky would literally have to fall for them to think that there's anything bad going on. I mean, it's, it's, it's very much like things are actually going much better than expected. And, we, and again, it's, I've never heard of a politician, and I've worked for three presidents, who ever wanted to have a press conference to highlight the negative things they were doing. Mm -hmm. I've ever heard someone say, I want to talk today about the, uh, what's happened under my watch and how badly it's gone. Let's go through that. Of course no one wants to do that. So when I hear legislators who have gone to the state of Colorado, well, great. Uh, who are you meeting with? Well, uh, the person who worked for the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association took us on the door. Oh, okay, well, who did you meet with? Well, the marijuana industry, this place, this. Oh, the dispensary was so clean. It was much better than I thought it was going to be. And really, everything was nicely labeled. It was a really nice tour. I mean, that's really what a legislator told me the other day. And I said, well, did you meet with the largest treatment center in Denver? Well, who's that? Okay. Did you meet with the homeless shelter? No. Did you meet, did you go talk to the superintendent of schools? Cherry Creek Schools, one of the most, uh, uh, the most prosperous school districts in the country. Why don't you talk to the superintendent and ask what's gone on with the money there? They're not getting that picture at all. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of newspapers are so ready to write that story about they visited Colorado and what happened. If you go to visitdenver.org, you can read the comments from people who have been to Colorado for conventions. You can read about how they talk about the homeless situation, the smell of weed every, everywhere, this is the public streets reek of weed, um, the large group of miners attacking tourists who are high. I mean, all of these kinds of things that are actually making people say, you know what, we, we probably want to rethink our conventions, re rethink this. A lot of people think this is going to be great for tourism. They're like, oh, we'll have weed tours and all of that. I mean, if that's what you want your city to have the weed tours and all this, fine, uh, okay. But you really need to know what you're getting yourself into. Um, and I think it's very important to make the distinction, as I was really trying to do in the beginning, between legalization, which is really the commercialization of marijuana, the promotion, the advertising, and this idea of removing criminal penalties. Because right now it's a false dichotomy, right? It's legalization or incarceration. In, oh, sorry. In reality, uh, there are multiple issues, three in particular, that should not be conflated, that often are conflated. One is, the, is just possession of marijuana, which is very different than the medical use and medical use of compounds, which I'm not talking about today. The only thing I'll say about that is I don't think medicine should be left up to popular vote. I know that might sound crazy, right, because we should all vote on medicine, right? We're all qualified to do that. Um, I don't think medicine should be left up to politicians. I know, terrible. I think this is very radical, that it should be left up to science. That the scientific method should determine what it is, and that if you're desperately in need of something and you say it helps, we can make exceptions. But the idea that it's just, if popular vote and opinion in a popularity contest says something is medicine, then it's by definition medicine, I have a little bit of a problem with. but. We're not talking about that today. Um, I will say there are promising components of marijuana that can have medical value, and that's very good. We want to promote that. Um, just as we would promote components of any plant or substance having medical value. Um, but those should be behind the counter at pharmacies with doctors, not at the guy who literally, when I went into a pot shop once and I said, what is your experience in selling these, this medicine? He said, um, well, I, don't, I have a GED, but I have a lot of experience with the drug, right? And he didn't mean textbook experience. Um, that's not really, I think, what we owe the desperately ill. I, I know a lot of parents that have shopped online for CBD oil because they saw Sanjay Gupta and they said it was, you know, it's going to be a miracle drug. And they're getting something back when we've tested it that has heavy metals, that has pesticides, molds, 
high levels of THC, which actually THC promotes seizures in high levels. You don't want it in high levels for somebody that has like a uncontrollable uh, epilepsy. And yet they thought they were getting regulated. They couldn't believe the FDA hadn't looked at this. They, they couldn't believe this could be promoted the way it is with zero uh, uh, oversight, which is zero oversight. And that's wrong. We have to expedite research, which we can do. We have to have it available. And if you're in a desperate situation, there are exceptions that should be made. I agree with that with any substance, not just this one. Uh, but that is very different than the issue which often gets conflated, which is about legalization. I'll go to a hearing on legalization and they'll bring someone in a wheelchair and say, this saved my life. That's why you should legalize it. That's like bringing, I can bring someone in from the hospital and says, uh, uh, Dilaudid saved my life. Well, Dilaudid is hydromorphone. That is medical grade heroin. It's actually pure heroin that you can probably find on the street. That's not an argument to legalize heroin. That's an argument to use that medicine in a properly dosed and regulated, controlled way. So we mix these issues up and the industry loves it. They couldn't have a better spokesperson than someone who has an illness that elicits compassion. We can't let them get away with it. They are not, they should not be speaking for the seriously ill. Uh, we have to separate these issues. And I like to talk about what the, you know, this country's fastest growing drug dealer looks like. Because um, I think it's important because when we think about the fastest growing drug dealer, we wouldn't think about something that you know, looked like this. And how this is much more about Wall Street than Woodstock, much more about Silicon Valley than any you know, college campus. Um, that is actually what scares me because these guys are laughing all the way to the bank. And while we're kind of all looking the other way and flirting with the idea and promoting the idea and more kids and frankly more in society, it's not just kids that are hurt, it's people who are driving, it's people at the workplace, it's others that are hurt by this. I think we really have to rethink this and we have to make people understand that we are not really, hardly ever now talking about this, that we're really talking about this. Do you think if you had this picture in front of every New Jersey voter and they could say legal or not, that they would choose legal? I don't think so. I'll take that deal any day of the week. But that's what we're talking about. Nobody has said in this whole debate, well, let's limit the per THC percentage. They don't want to limit the percentage because they make money from the, this stuff. That's where the real money comes in. You know, these, these oils, this, this hash oil here, this is 99% pure. This doesn't look like marijuana from you know, the Berkeley days in the 60s. Not at all. This is something very, very, very different. And by the way, we barely know what this is doing to the adolescent, let alone adult brain, when it's being used. Our research showing three times increase in schizophrenia among regular users, four time uh, increase in risk for psychosis, increase in risk of an eight point loss of IQ, all of that is done on marijuana that's around 15% or less THC. We barely know what this stuff's doing. And yet, people are writing these, on purpose, very overbroad laws that are saying, you know, let's just legalize marijuana. This isn't marijuana, by the way. I mean, this, this is not what anybody would say was marijuana. Marijuana is, again, hundreds of components. This is one main component, THC. And so we really have to make people accountable and say, okay, great, let's just be very clear. You're not only legalizing this, you're legalizing this. And really, really understand that. Um, we know that the state legislators in multiple states where it's legal are now taking money from the marijuana industry. We did this poster, kind of like the Newport ad, Alive with Pleasure, um, for those that remember that. Um, kind of having fun with it, but the issue is in Colorado, almost half of the state legislators are taking some pot money from either the industry or related, in related industries that are making a lot of money off of it. And, you know, Someone's got to call them out. I mean, we can't. I mean, it's very, very clear this is really about. But and by the way, every single Colorado regulator who has been dealing with marijuana on the high level has basically lasted a few years and then gone to work for the marijuana industry. I get that. That so some people said, well, Kevin, that happens in this and this and this. And this. Yeah, I don't think two wrongs make a right. So what? That doesn't justify. Doesn't make this right. If it happens in other fields. Um, but it is happening. There are no regulations or laws on it at all. I showed you that already. Um, the illicit market of marijuana. Well, at least you could say, well, Kevin, and all these, at least we're putting the drug dealers like out of business, right? Yeah, they're all becoming dentists and ice cream men. That's what they do. Oh, legal, we're out of here. We're going so. 
No. They adjust. And you can't see this on the slide, but the increase in black market marijuana has skyrocketed in Colorado. Oregon now makes between three and eight times as much, depending on which, who, what study you believe. And either one of them, it proves the point, three to eight times as much marijuana as can be legally consumed. Where does that go? It doesn't just like disappear, it doesn't just go away because it's not under the legal market. Of course it goes to the black market. There was a story in the ultra-conservative, alt-right, far-right-wing NPR yesterday <laughs> <laughs> that said in Washington state, they have a glut of illegal marijuana. The illegal market is booming, and there are a few reasons for this. One, the illegal market can easily undercut the legal price. They don't pay taxes. They don't have hours. They don't worry about age uh, you know, limits. They don't play by the rules. They can sell and undercut that legal tax price. You know that, oh, we're going to be so responsible and tax it. The other reason is in these states where they're growing so much, it's got to go somewhere. And it's going to the illegal market. They're funneling it to different folks. It's a mess. And you now, by the way, not only are you going to need more officer, uh, fellow officers for the driving thing, now we need them to go after the black market actors. Because when, when, the, when the demand increases, it's not just on the legal side that it goes up. It's also the illegal side for a lot of reasons. And then, of course, the communities of color. Because we're told this is a social justice issue. I don't think it's social justice that in Colorado, the rate of black and Hispanic youth arrest rate has gone up since legalization, not down. I don't think it's social justice that there are community, basically the, the poorer communities, uh, we see the concentration of marijuana stores. Um, this is a very bad deal for social justice. If you're interested in social justice and not giving people a record and expunging their previous record and giving them a second chance and making sure that if they are testing positive at work that they get treatment and can work while they're in treatment so they don't, all that is great, sign me up. I mean, we are actually supportive of Ron Rice's bill that says that and other bills that say that. That's good. We do want to give people another chance. But the idea that we have to legalize in order to get social justice, again, is not it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Um, it's going to make the stuff a lot worse. And then one of my favorite new ones, which I'm sure you've heard, that, well, lo and behold, marijuana, okay, <laughs> this is great. Marijuana is not only the answer to Mexican drug cartels. It doesn't only solve all of your budget problems. It's not only a cure for cancer. Now it's a cure for the opioid epidemic. I mean, this thing is, oh, and it makes you a better driver, too, because they said you could drive 30 in a 70 mile per hour zone. You must be better. Um, than, than the average driver, I guess. That's what somebody told me the other day. Um, you know, it's being sold for everything, and now it's being sold for opioids. And you might have seen this, uh, this billboard or similar ones that said, states that legalized marijuana had 25% fewer opioid-related deaths, brought to you, by the way, by our favorite scientists at that very, very evidence-based organization called Weed Maps, <laughs> which is, by the way, the Yelp for marijuana. Nothing to do with science. I was being sarcastic. Yeah. Uh, so Weed Maps has this everywhere. And you know, that's interesting. Um, when we saw that, it was like, well, what are they citing? Okay, they're citing, citing one study. Okay. What is that study saying? Okay, it's saying this. Did that study look at maybe another reason why there could have been a reduced amount of opioids? Did they look at it, was there increased treatment? Oh, well, they didn't look at that. Okay. Then I asked the author, did you look at naloxone? You know, naloxone programs that reverse opioid. Was there an increase in, but by the way, there's been a huge increase in all states, especially Colorado, of naloxone administration. Have, did you look at that? Did you control for naloxone? Oh, no, we didn't do that. Oh, okay. Did you control for a prescription drug monitoring program? Because now they're, you know, you have to monitor the pills that are coming in. Did you control for that being a reason for Oh no, we didn't do that either. Okay, did you control for the fact that people are moving away from opioids in the last few years? It's actually not painkillers, but it's actually the fentanyls and heroin? No, we didn't do that. Um, which opioids did you look at? Well, only the ones we had date data for, which were basically two. Out of, so <laughs> now that's not a level of nuance and question that probably the average person is gonna be thinking about, which is great for wheat maps because they put this up and it sounds very compelling. Um, but it is totally incomplete, and it, what's not being told here, which is the real story, is that 
marijuana precedes almost every other illegal drug activity. It is very hard to find somebody. I don't care if they're addicted to Oxycontin today, if they're unfortunately using fentanyl, the fentanyls, if they're on heroin. Absolutely 90 plus percent of those people, I'm not saying it was a gateway drug for all of them, or you know, it's a difficult relationship, but what you can say for 90 percent for sure is that marijuana played a role early on. But you know, this so-called opiate epidemic, it's not an opioid epidemic, first of all. It's an addiction epidemic. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, you are much less likely to die of an opioid overdose if you haven't mixed with a benzodiazepine or alcohol. M this is about poly drug use, multiple drug use. This isn't just about the opioids. Yes, the overdose itself is often driven by an opioid, but there are other drugs that are in factor. And let me tell you, the person who's dying of an opioid overdose is not some 15-year-old that's never used drugs before that just wakes up and says, you know, I've been sober, I'm 50, I'm gonna try heroin today. No, that's not how it works. It's also not a 40-year-old who never abused anything in the past and then all of a sudden because his doctor gave him 100 Oxycontin, that was it, and then he became totally addicted and then died. There is almost always other either undiagnosed or diagnosed substance use disorders going on early on in that person's life. Because by the way, 85% of those prescribed opioids will not get addicted to them. And that sounds controversial, but it's true. In fact, if we didn't have opioids, we'd have a public health crisis on our hands in terms of the under treatment of pain. And by the way, we don't get a penny from opioid companies, even though the marijuana industry thinks that we do and likes to spread that rumor. We don't take a penny from pharma. But that's just the reality. And so when people say that, well, this is opioids and marijuana could substitute, marijuana is a driver often for other drugs. It doesn't predict everybody using other drugs. Actually, most people who use marijuana, lo and behold, they don't like it. They hate it. They stop using it. Because why? 50% of Americans have tried marijuana in their lifetime. That's a lot. But regular users, less than 10%. Most people don't like it. They use it once or twice. Some people will use it for a few years at a certain phase of their life, and then they move on and they don't use it anymore. It's not this universally loved thing used by everybody. But of those people who unfortunately go on to use those other drugs, you will almost always find marijuana there. So this billboard, I actually wanted to go put this, this billboard up instead says states with ice cream eaters had 25% more drowning deaths. Now the ice cream industry would be very upset, and they should be upset because I'm implying that ice cream is somehow forcing drownings. Well, maybe there's some other factor going on. Well, let's see, what could that be? Well, um, maybe it was hot in those states where they were swimming, and therefore they were also eating ice cream. But you wouldn't know that from reading that. Now, if, you, if I controlled for the temperature, and I said, actually, I controlled for that. I, aver I only got the states that were like between 70 and 75 degrees, and so I controlled for the heat. Then maybe it is ice cream that's doing something, or maybe it's something else. But this doesn't tell me anything. This is as accurate as this is. And yet, it's out there because logically, and it's great for the pot industry, you can, you can say, well, you know, someone wants to take something that's like marijuana. It's not as like hard on their stomach, and it's not as bad as an opioid. So that's probably what they're doing. Maybe some people probably do that. I'm not denying that some people don't do that. But the reality is from a macro level, we do not have the evidence. And it's not just me that says this. The Journal of Addiction, which is the most prominent journal in the field, editorialized last month and said medical marijuana is not an answer to the opioid epidemic. Now, these are senior researchers, very skeptical of drug policy normally, academics. They couldn't believe how this is being run through by all kinds of folks mainly the pot industry, saying that this is happening. Um, in fact, when you look at some of the animal studies that we're now doing on marijuana and heroin, much more interesting to look at why do THC-exposed rats, for example, pursue heroin much more avidly than a non-THC-exposed rat? What is going on in the brain? What is happening there with the THC receptors and the opioid receptors? We don't have all the answers. But we do know even in utero, when you expose THC in utero in these, uh, in these mice, the adult offspring you know, when, seek heroin more avidly. That's interesting. And by the way, in utero, one issue there, uh, I don't know if you saw the news last week, it says 70% of Colorado pot shops recommend marijuana, have recommended marijuana 
for morning sickness for the first trimester. Now, do you think that the average Coloradan who voted for medical marijuana intended for that to happen? It's totally unhinged what's going on, um, and it's spread by false information. Uh, future parents exposed to THC long before pregnancy, we also see it. So it's new research. They're still looking at it. There's other research that needs to happen. It's not definitive. But the much more interesting question is, what is it about THC receptors and opioid receptors? Is it something where you want an, a bigger high? That's what a lot of people with substance use disorders have reported. Is it something, what is going on in the brain that, that, is, that is causing that? In fact, the gold standard of studies is when you can do a study of twins and you can have, because you can control for genetics, and have half the twins doing something that you want to look at and half the twins that don't do it and then see what's going on with another behavior. The twin study, a famous twin study in New Zealand, which showed 400 twins, half of which used marijuana before 17 and half of which didn't. Pretty amazing that they could find that. Um, they found that the ones who, the twin pair that used marijuana before 17 was four and a half times more likely to use opioids or heroin later in life than the twin that was um, waited at least till after 17 years old. So there are these big differences. And the National Academy of Sciences report, and you shouldn't take my word for any of this, you should look it up. The National Academy of Sciences also acknowledges marijuana use. By the way, this is a graph of a Colorado and one drug that has skyrocketed since legalization, and it's not marijuana, if you can guess what it is. It's opioids. Opioid use has gone up in Colorado opioid-related deaths. Now, how in the world could you get that billboard even to be, well, when you do fancy statistics and gymnastics with stats, which they teach you to do as a PhD, you can, I guess, get any answer you want. This is the reality, and medical marijuana is on the left, and the dark red is when commercial marijuana started, and the fully legalized in gray. This is what's happening with opioids in the state of Colorado. That includes heroin and everything else. So. It's very, very important to look at those numbers. This is the report that you can find on our website. Uh, I talked about the communities of color. I want to give kind of three ways how you can get involved in things because it's a lot of information. And you know, this New Jersey has become a top priority state for us and for a lot of people around the country, frankly, who want to legalize marijuana, uh, obviously. Uh, and we have a lot of work to do in New Jersey, but I think we can do it. First of all, um, sign up for alerts and news on our website. Donate if you'd like as well. We're a 501c3. Grassroots organizing. We have an app that's a, that's a really cool um, advocacy app that wasn't cheap to make, but it's free to download, thankfully, for you. Uh, and it's called the Sam Action app. And it basically is like a closed Facebook group to share um, evidence, stories. You see our tweets that are happening. Um, you can, with one click, write your legislator. It's a tool to get involved in your community. Um, <laughs> Sam Action. You can also text SAM, S-A-M, to 797-979 to get the download link. Um, and then you can always connect with us, info at learnaboutsam.org. Um, the biggest pot, uh, one of the biggest sort of marijuana enthusiasts in Congress uh, is actually saying that they were gaining more me momentum, but that's flipped and they're more on the defensive. And I think they're more on the defensive. Sadly, as more states legalize, I can't tell you the amount of email and contact and phone calls we got on a regular basis from citizens in these states who said, they didn't tell me that it was going to be like this. I didn't care before because I didn't think I would be affected by it. That's the biggest lesson I can leave all of you. You're not, thankfully, in that stage. I mean, you know, if we, you're not in that stage yet. And when you get to that stage, it's not like you can do nothing. It's not like there's nothing you can do, but it's a lot harder. And so what's important right now is that you're educated, that you speak to people that you know, that you get involved with NJ Ramp and SAM. The NJ Ramp website, which is a New Jersey Center website of ours, is nj-ramp.org. Um, we really need more people to get involved, more people to speak out. I believe Patrick Kennedy when he tells me that we're on the right side of history. Um, I think people who talked about smoking in a way and was, said, you know, maybe pregnant women shouldn't smoke. Maybe we shouldn't be smoking around kids in restaurants. Maybe we do want to look at the research with lung cancer in 1918. They were right. Uh, and we're right today, no matter what happens tomorrow, next year, this term, next term. This is a long-term game. And uh, I think it's really important that you stand up for what's right because the marijuana industry, because it's about money, you know, when it becomes about money, that's why like you don't mix family with money, friends with money, things get weird. And uh, in this case, public health gets totally shoved aside. 
because of private profit and money. And we need people to stand up to those interests and to really stand up for science and what's right. So I want to thank you all for being here, for listening to this, and I uh, hope you can get involved. Thank you. Oh, yeah.